when the biblical text was being constructed, I believe this is a TR, by what authority were some manuscripts accepted and other manuscripts rejected? So the question is being asked, when the TR is being constructed, what's the standard in regards to what texts are being used and what are not? Well, in this case, it was whatever Erasmus could get his hands on. <laughs> I mean, that's there, there are so few. Um, but it's fascinating to listen to the response. By the good providence of God. By the good providence of God. There is your standard. Good providence of God. Well, um, you can answer anything that way. Um, why do we use the manuscripts we use today? By the good providence of God. It doesn't really communicate much factual information at all. Are we talking about... I think like, it's a reference to... Like, with Erasmus and others. What were like Beza, I think that Erasmus had, they say, the six manuscripts that he had, which were all Byzantine as far as I know. Uh, no, no, there's one. The, 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 the manuscript one. Yeah, manuscript one was not, and he did not rely upon it. So basically, you see with Erasmus, he's favoring readings that reflect the traditional text as received from the Greeks. And his oldest manuscript, which differs more, he doesn't rely on it so much. When you get to Beza, you know, you got Codex Beza, for instance, which is an old uncial, and yet he rejects it as spurious and corrupt. Again, because it doesn't conform with the uh, received traditional text as it was in manuscript form at that time. But I think one thing is, I mean, there are limits to our historical knowledge to understand every process that went about intellectually for he and other edit, Erasmus and other uh, Protestant editor, the Protestant editors who came after um, Stephanus and Beza. Uh, we, we, we don't have immediate access to, to all their historical decisions, but we do have their in, the end product. We have the end product. We actually have all of Erasmus's annotations. And these gentlemen are going to direct people um, to the King James Bible defended, the King James Version defended, Edward F. Hill's work. And he's the one that lays it out. We've got to get away from the humanism of Erasmus. So, from Hill's perspective, Erasmus used humanistic thinking to derive the vast majority of the unique readings of the Textus Receptus. But now, now, that has become providential preservation. How do you defend that in any context? How do you do that? And we also, you know, you were talking about, it's an interesting historical question. I can tell you, having read some of this stuff, there, there are lots of different answers given to how many manuscripts did Erasmus have. Some will say six, some will say seven, some will say 12. Truth is, I don't think we really know how many manuscripts he had access to. I, I'm, I say that with a, a caveat, because maybe we, maybe there is a way historically to know, but I at this point I can't cite a source, a reliable source that tells me exactly how how many manuscripts he had. It's a, it's a question. But anyways, and we so we're not privy to all the processes. But again, we have the final product, Are and we know that it was received and, and that, that it was used and it was used as a basis for translations and it was taken by the the Protestant scholars who came after. Are you saying? See, no, you 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 need to understand that when they say it was received. They imbue that term with a spiritual nature. It was received by the church. Um, that the, in a way, the Latin Vulgate never was, though there would have been people who argued that. Um, they don't point to a point in time. They don't point to a place. They don't point to a council. But it was received. And having been received, it now becomes unquestionable. It... It was received, and koinonia became the correct reading in Ephesians 3.9, when it was received. When? Where? How? Can't tell you. Just believe. We, can't, we don't know their critical method, so that if all the TRs disappeared in the world, we couldn't go back to the manuscripts and use their critical method. To okay, and here's, this, was, this was what I was looking for. Um, and we'll wrap up with this. Um, from the beginning, and I have been addressing this for a number of years now, 
I have presented an argument that I, I've never had a single scholar in the field uh, disagree with what I've said on this subject. It's, it's sort of a, well, duh. It's a shame you have to deal with this kind of stuff, James, but you have fun. Reminds me of Norman Geisler many years ago when I wrote, when I wrote the King James Only Controversy. He says, you go get him, James. We're right behind you. We may be a long ways behind you, but we're right behind you. Because most people just don't want to deal with this. They don't want to, they don't want to have the, the mocking done and stuff like that, which is what you're going to get. It's, it's, for some reason, I don't know why, King James only us mock. What do we find here? Mock. It just, I guess once you, you have the text and you know something other people don't know, then that somehow impacts how you respond to that. I, I, I don't know. But um, anyway, um, the argument that I have repeated over and over again and that has not yet even been enunciated, let alone answered, is that this position cannot present a methodology of textual criticism, canons and rules for analyzing manuscript evidence that if applied to the modern number of manuscripts that we have would produce the Textus Receptus. They use one argument for Ephesians 3.9 and another argument for Revelation 16.5 and another argument for the Pericope Adultery and another argument for Romans, uh, Revelation 14.1. And they use whatever argument leads the TR. And if it's, a, if it's the exact opposite argument... So, Look at all these manuscripts that read that have the longer ending of Mark. Ephesians 3 9, there are none at all. <laughs> look at the look at Irenaeus cites the longer ending. Irenaeus never cites Koinonia. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's in the TR. So believe. So they have no interest. In being able to say, we are consistently trying to apply principles of textual critical study to the facts. They're not. In fact, they're saying, we have no interest in these things. It's been received. We can't tell you what that means. We can't tell you who did it. We can't tell you when it happened. But we can only tell you just, if, if you'll believe it, then you'll have a stable text. And you'll never have to worry about these things again. And that's why I, that's when I hold up the Book of Mormon. That's when I grab the Quran, whatever else it might be. That's when I, I point you back to Adnan Rashid in London saying, hey, as long as we can get back to Uthman, that's good enough for me. It's the same attitude. We want the stable text. We will trade truth. Well, for certainty. You can be certain of the stable text. It's not truthful, but we're certain. There you go. Now, that's an argument I've been making for a long time. I don't know. It's possible because I've met other people like this. It's possible that, for example, Dr. Riddle doesn't even listen to what I say. It's possible. Sometimes there are, are folks that, that just the way that they're built, they would rather hear what somebody, they'll have somebody else listen and then summarize it for them and then write a response to, to the summary. Um, but the argument has been, can you present a consistent methodology that would reproduce the text of the TR from the current manuscript tradition? Or even from the manuscripts that Erasmus had, you still wouldn't come up with it. That somehow gets turned into, if all the TRs were burned, could you reproduce the TR? What? Listen for yourself. The scholars who came after us. Are you us. saying we can't, we don't know their critical method so that if all the TRs disappeared in the world, we couldn't go back to the manuscripts and use their critical method to reproduce the TR? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. If y'all heard that, uh, what's your critical method where you could reproduce the TR if all the TRs disappeared? Well, turn that around. If all the critical texts disappeared... So you lost all your critical text, and I'll give you your full-blown CGBM, and your, you know, you, you, you've got your, you've got your system. We'll give you your system, but take away all the critical text. You're starting over again. 
if you believe that they're going to come back with an identical copy of the NA-28, it's exceedingly naive because... No, it's not. Um, the entire purpose is to be consistent in the application of the principles. And you guys have readings where there are no principles that could ever give rise to your readings. There is no principle of textual criticism that will ever defend the reading of Koinonia at Ephesians 3.9. There aren't any. But you will defend it. Therefore, the point is established. Now, why you won't respond to it, I'll let you answer for that. Why you make up other arguments so it sounds like you're responding to it when you're really not, I'll let you answer that too. These canons of criticism are just not that objective. They cannot deliver a text. Um, We've already talked about all the places where not sure. Here's three different readings. Not sure, not sure, not sure. Um, Yeah, so I mean, it's, again, that's right. So would you rather have not sure or sure of a lie? What should you rather have? The danger is, and again, I, I realize th- these guys don't do apologetics. But they evidently have not talked to a lot of people who are absolutely sure of a lie. They have absolute certainty. They haven't looked into the eyes of all those Mormon missionaries. I'm absolutely certain. Book of Mormon is the word of God. So they, they don't see the danger. They don't see the danger. That's right. Could you, could you reproduce the TR? I mean, it, it, it's, it's completely dismissing what the actual argument actually is and presenting this hypothetical that even your own position couldn't live up to. Well, it's a nonsensical objection because what we're saying is that the reconstruction, this method doesn't work. That's right. And yeah. so the, his challenge is, well, if we took away all the printed TRs, how could you reconstruct the text? We're, we're, that's what, that's fundamentally yeah. our point. You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so we would say, nope, we can't do that. Yeah. We couldn't do that. We, don't, we, we wouldn't be able to do that. So thankfully, it's a hypothetical, and the printed editions aren't going to disappear. <laughs> um, but we couldn't use that method because we don't think it's a proper method. So it's a, it's a nonsensical question. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Well, it, it was, because it was a straw man, of course. Um, but the actual objection is not nonsensical. It makes perfect sense. And the fact is, the text that you are telling people is providentially preserved came into existence by a mechanism that if you would simply admit what that mechanism was, your system would collapse. It would collapse. So, there's there's more after that. There's oh, I had a whole bunch more here I was going to get into. Um, drat. Um, there, there was, I think, an important part here. Hold on a second. Puyan is an excellent uh, example here. Uh, I did an interview with him. It's on my YouTube channel about can you use the received text of Muslims? Because of course we've been. What would an argument against a modern liberal scholar like Bart Ehrman look like? Would a confessional advocate have a apologetic against Bart Ehrman? I would say it looked very much like a creationist debating an evolutionist. You know, because one, we're talking about a faith-based presuppositional defense of Scripture, so we would be arguing for the authenticity of Scripture based on a lot of the very things you've heard here in this conference, and Bart Ehrman would be defending, you know, his view of reason eclecticism. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, it, what, what is it? We're, we're debating epistemology. That's right. Okay, so you need to understand, these gentlemen are absolutely convinced that their position is epistemological, how you know what you know. And they believe that the confessional statement of the role of the Spirit in the conviction of the reality of the Word of God in the Westminster and the London Baptist Confession gives them the basis for removing the text from history, identifying the text of the early 17th century as providentially preserved, and therefore saying that's what has always existed, and that's what we are to defend, but not defend historically. They are absolutely convinced that this is an issue of epistemology. 
And I think they are treading on extremely dangerous ground in totally destroying any meaningful Christian epistemology at all because of the fact they are conflating categories that should never be conflated. But a lot of people just haven't done enough thinking through to see where those category errors are, specifically canon, text, the whole name of their conference. But that wasn't the main thing I wanted to get to there. This is agreeing with Bart Ehrman, and somehow that's, you know, winning a debate with Bart Ehrman by actually agreeing with all of his critical principles. Yeah. Well, it, would, it actually would be a contrasting opinions, Amen. which would, it would actually be a debate, right. mm -hmm. because there would be people defending you know, the text of Scripture versus, you know, someone who wants to alter it, change it. Yeah, there, was, there were no differences of opinion between myself and, and Bart Ehrman. That's, that's what everybody said. Actually, actually, almost nobody said that. But, you know, I, I'm skeptical of, um, you know, the whole discernment ministry, apologetics industry. I, I think we need to preach the gospel to Bart Ehrman. So this is what I want to get into. And, and we'll fin I, I'm sorry, I said I was good. I, I will finish up after this. I apologize. Um... This was the main thing. This is the first one I wanted to get to. I'm getting to it right at the end. Okay. Um, I was very glad when I heard this yesterday um, because if they're being truthful in what they're saying here, then one of my concerns has been alleviated, and that is they're not going to be taking this into the marketplace of ideas. They're not going to be taking this into debate. They're not going to be uh, engaging um, on university campuses and, and doing debates and things like that. Um, they're, they're just going to keep this, you know, they're just going to preach the gospel. And since the gospel of the TR and the gospel of the critical text are the same, since the gospel of the um, Tyndale House Creek New Testament or the UBS 5 or Nessie Allen 28th or Nessie Allen 23rd or the majority text, Robinson Pierpont, whatever, since the gospel is the same in all of those, as I've said for decades, same hermeneutics, same exegesis applied to Tyndale House, Westcott Hort, 1881, Texas Receptus. Use the same sound methods of interpretation, take it all into consideration, um, same gospel. So if that's all they're going to do is preach the gospel, then you can preach the gospel from the TR, you can preach the gospel, however, as long as you're not engaging other people, as long as you don't have to answer questions about your text, as long as you won't answer questions about your text, then great. They say they're not going to do it. Sort of. Because in the section I had just been playing later on where they're talking about, about a Muslim, the Muslim they're talking to, who they've gotten into the TR stuff, basically said that most of the time they have to deal with textual critical stuff is because of converts who encounter that dreaded text critical stuff. And here's, here's the scary part. The converts want a certain word of God like they had as a Muslim. So they thought they had a text that was monolithic and never changed as a Muslim, and now they want the same thing as a Christian. And these guys are happy to come along and say, here it is. The problem is, both are lies. <laughs> Both are not true. Both have a history. Both have textual variations. That's the reality. But there are still people, they don't want that. I, I, no, I don't want that. I just want, no, just give me, just give me something without any footnotes. So here's the, here's the, here's your 1924 Cairo text for the Quran. No footnotes. No questions. Here's your the Trinitarian Bible Society TR, no footnotes, no notes, no questions. Have at it. There you go. Neither one of them is connected to history, but that's that's how they go. Uh, we need to, we need to just evangelize him rather than debate with him. Amen. He's a sinner who needs to find Christ. He's an apostate, sir. Um, he made a profession of faith. Uh, he was involved with campus evangelism at Moody Bible Institute. Um, he's, he's, he's heard all that before, sadly. He's an apostate, a knowledgeable, knowing apostate. Maybe you don't know enough about him, but there you go. Um, 
I, I mean, I guess we could say there's a way to defend the faith so that people, the believers are encouraged and unbelievers are, will, will hear a testimony to the faithfulness of God and His Word. But again, I, I wonder what's the, is that, does that reflect apostolic ministry? Yes. Do we read about, you know, Paul scheduling debates? Now, I know among some of the early apologists, I, I don't even know that. In- yes, Paul went into the marketplace and he... Uh, dialogued. He debated. Yes, he d- he did that with Jews. He did that with others. Yes, yeah, he actually did do that. Okay, so we're writing letters to the emperor saying, "Here's why you shouldn't persecute us." Uh, I guess we've got Justin Martyr's uh, dialogue with Trifo, yep, the Jew. But I'm not. Sh- but that- Which got into textual critical issues, by the way, and would demonstrate that Justin didn't have the TR. <laughs> just thought I'd mention that in passing. He doesn't quote from the TR. It's just... so that's, again, that's post-apostolic ministry. Where do we find that in, in apostolic ministry, where there are debates with unbelievers? I've often said that what we're seeing in that whole debate world, and the reform world is so enamored with that, mm-hmm. it's a, that is a, uh, it's a function of the academy, not the church. You know, like you say, where have I been called to? Even when you talk about giving it a fence for the hope that's within you, turning that into the formal debate, it's like, eh, this some exegetical problem big time with turning, giving it a fence for the faith in the biblical sense to a formal academic debate where you, uh, I mean, one of the problems with it is you're, you're, you're just, there's like a, an assumed equal ground between the positions. Really? <sighs> I. Anyone who has, just, just, all you have to do is go back to two weeks ago to Melbourne, where I discussed, I think on the first night, dealing with the postmodern situation, um, the reality that there is no neutral ground. There is no um, equality between positions. Um, I have, again, for decades, said the exact opposite, do not function in that way. And uh, so if I'm going to have a formal academic debate with Ehrman or Muslim, let's say, then, you know, it's uh, the, 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 the hearer is supposed to listen with a blank slate to hear the ideas from both sides, and we respectfully let a heretic present heresy. So I just can't conceive of Paul opening up the church saying, let's put a parenthesis in here. Um. Paul didn't have any churches. <laughs> um, Paul went went out into the marketplace of ideas. Uh, they used whatever buildings they could at the time. That's a little bit of an anachronistic uh, application. You know, I said that. I mean, I guess we've got descriptions of Paul at Acts going into the synagogue and and you know reasoning from the scriptures with people. So uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll refine that a little bit. Maybe there was a maybe there is a place in apostolic ministry for that to some certain degree. But, um, you, know, you know, with regard to, say, Bart Ehrman. Okay, I just wanted you to hear what they had to say um, regarding the whole idea of, of debate. Um, I'm very happy that basically what I hear them saying is, we're not going to do that. We're going to stay out of that. Good, 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 good. It still concerns me when I see people being drawn into this because that's just that fewer number of people that are going to be available to, uh, to engage our culture and to give a robust and uh, consistent, coherent uh, defense of the New Testament as having been truly preserved by God through history, not through re-inspiration. Um, but if that's what we have to face, that's what we have to face um, Despite the um, obvious disrespect um, and denigration of these men, I pray that they will be used of the Lord, that um, if they truly believe that the Textus Receptus is all that and a bag of chips, that they will preach and teach it in its fullness— which would include preaching and teaching it to Stephen Anderson, who seems to have taken over their Facebook page, um, and defending the fact that the Textus Receptus uh, teaches repentance from sin as an absolute necessity of salvation, and teaches that 
God, by his spirit, grants the gifts of faith repentance. The Textus Receptus teaches these things. I hope everyone will be teaching these things to Stephen Anderson, who needs to hear these things because he denies them, even though he claims to, you know, read these things. He evidently can't read what it says there. And teach and preach. Go ahead, do it. But please stay out of any encounters where you're actually going to have to give um, a defense of the New Testament because you've abandoned the field that the Lord has provided to us in which we can. That's basically the issue there.